In the latest episode of our podcast, Into the Killing, we cover the case of Lisa Kimmel. In April 1982, Lisa was driving her car from Denver, Colorado to Cody, Wyoming. But tragically, she never made it there. After she went missing, there were more than a thousand sightings of her and her car. And what unfolded in the weeks and years after she went missing was very bizarre. You can find this episode and our 31 other episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and anywhere you find great podcasts. Number 3. Glenn Stewart Godwin Glenn Stewart Godwin was born in June 1958 in Miami, Florida. Glenn was a law-abiding citizen for the early part of his life, but that all changed in the summer of 1980. At the time, he was living in Palm Springs, California, working several menial jobs like being a mechanic, a construction worker, and a tool salesman. Then he hatched a plan to rob his friend, 26-year-old Kim Robert Lavalley. Lavalley was a pilot who transported marijuana into the United States from Mexico. Glenn was annoyed that Lavalley made what he considered easy money. Glenn worked three jobs, and he was $25,000 in debt. He also owed Lavalley $7,000. Nevertheless, Glenn convinced Lavalley they should buy a condo together. On August 1st, 1980, Glenn told Lavalley to come over to the apartment that he shared with 31-year-old Frank Soto. He told Lavalley to bring over the money for the down payment on the condo. Soto claims that just a few hours before Lavalley arrived, Glenn told him that he was going to rob Lavalley and then throw him out of the apartment. Soto said Glenn would give him a signal and that he was supposed to restrain Lavalley. But when the time came to do that, Soto didn't move. Glenn and Lavalley ended up going out to play tennis. They returned to the apartment at about 11 p.m. Once they were back, Lavalley told Glenn he needed to pay the $7,000 back quicker. Then Glenn signaled for Soto to grab Lavalley. Soto said that he held Lavalley's arms behind his back and then Glenn started punching him in the face. Lavalley fell to the floor and Glenn stomped on his head and chest. Glenn then got a towel and tried to strangle Lavalley, but the towel ripped. So Glenn went into the kitchen and grabbed a knife. He then started stabbing Lavalley and he kept doing it until Lavalley stopped moving. Glenn ended up stabbing him 28 times. Glenn then asked his former roommate, 35 year old Roy Dickey, to come over. When Dickey entered the apartment, Glenn pointed a gun at him. Glenn told Dickey that he needed help getting rid of the body or he would kill Dickey's girlfriend and his five children. So Dickey reluctantly agreed to help. They all loaded Lavalley's body into Lavalley's truck and then Dickey drove to the Chocolate Mountains Aerial Gunnery Range southwest of Desert Center, California. Dickey made a bomb using fuel oil, nitrogen fertilizer, and dynamite. Then he blew up the truck with Lavalley's body inside of it. Two days later, some people found the remains of the truck and Lavalley. A few days after that, the police identified the remains as Kim Lavalley. The police investigation into the murder eventually led them to Glenn, Soto, and Dickey. They were all arrested in March 1980. Glenn went to trial first and the star witnesses against him were Soto and Dickey. They both testified that Glenn was the mastermind behind the murder. Dickey had made a plea deal. He would eventually plead guilty to being an accessory to murder he would be sentenced to two years in prison. He would end up serving 16 months. Soto agreed to testify against Glenn, even though he wasn't given a plea deal. Soto said he was testifying because he thought that Glenn was the most dangerous person he knew. Glenn testified on his own behalf and he claimed he would never kill anyone. He said that Dickie and Soto killed Lavalley and framed him. He said that on the night of the murder, he was out all night with a woman. 
However, the woman he claimed to be with didn't testify. Glenn's trial lasted three weeks and the jury deliberated for three days. He was found guilty of first degree murder. He was sentenced to 26 years to life in prison. Frank Soto was ultimately convicted of first degree murder and he was sentenced to 25 years to life. After Glenn was sentenced, he was incarcerated at the Dual Vocational Institution in Tracy, California. In early 1987, Glenn attempted to escape, but he was caught. He was transferred to Folsom State Maximum Security Prison in Folsom, California. Folsom is an incredibly secure prison. It had been open for 105 years when Glenn was transferred there and only two people had escaped. Not long after arriving there, Glenn set to work being the third person to escape. He started by paying another inmate who changed his work designation. This got Glenn assigned to work as a gardener in an older section of the prison which had less supervision. He should not have been allowed in that area because of his prior escape attempt. On June 5th, 1987, prison officials realized that 28-year-old Glenn Stewart Godwin was missing. They discovered that he got into a storm drain and he made his way to the American River. There was a raft waiting for him and he rode to shore. He then got into a car and vanished. Obviously, Glenn had help from the outside. It turned out that some tools, like a hacksaw, had been smuggled into the prison. The authorities concluded that Glenn's wife, Shelley Rose Godwin, and his former cellmate at Duel, Lawrence Carlick, helped him escape. Carlick was arrested three days after the prison break. Glenn and Shelley were labeled fugitives. Glenn had only served about six years of his sentence of 26 years to life. After Glenn escaped, he made his way to Mexico. He got work as a cocaine trafficker. In 1989, the American authorities learned that he was doing a seven-year sentence in prison in Jalisco, Mexico for trafficking. In February 1990, Glenn's wife, Shelley Godwin, was arrested in Dallas, Texas. At the time, she was five months pregnant. The American authorities wanted Glenn to be extradited, but there was a delay. The delay was caused because Glenn had stabbed to death another inmate who was a member of a drug cartel. Glenn was finally going to be extradited to the United States in the fall of 1991. But then, on September 26, 1991, he escaped from the Mexican prison. Where he went after that is unknown. In December 1996, Glenn was placed on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list. He stayed on there until May 2016, but he wasn't taken off because he was located. He simply no longer fit their top 10 criteria. Glenn Stewart Godwin has been spotted several times since his second prison escape. The last most credible sighting of him was in California in 1997. It's believed at the time of this recording he's living in Mexico or Central America. He has used the aliases Miguel Carrera, Nigel Lopez, and Dennis Harold McWilliams. Glenn is highly intelligent. He is six feet tall with a medium build, green eyes, and he is approximately 170 pounds. The FBI has stated they have no reason to believe that Glenn is dead. At the time of this video, if Glenn is alive, he would be 63 years old. The FBI considers him to be armed and dangerous. Number 2. William Leslie Arnold William Leslie Arnold was born on August 28, 1942, in Omaha, Nebraska. William, who preferred to be called Leslie, lived with his parents, William and Opal, and his brother, James, who was three years younger than him. On the morning of September 27, 1958, 16-year-old Leslie was on the phone with his girlfriend, Crystal. 
Leslie's father was at work, and his brother was working as an usher at a local rodeo. That night, Leslie and Crystal were planning on going to the drive-in. Leslie's mother, Opal, didn't think very highly of Crystal. While Leslie talked to Crystal on the phone, Opal called Crystal no good. Leslie and Opal didn't have a great relationship, and they had several heated arguments in the past. When Opal called Crystal no good, he thought that Crystal heard the comment and another argument ensued. Leslie got so angry that he punched the wall. Opal thought that his behavior was outrageous and she told him that he wasn't taking the car that night. Leslie threatened to hurt his mother if she kept disrespecting Crystal. Opal was sick of dealing with her 16-year-old son and ordered him to go to his room. Once Leslie was in his bedroom, he tried to come up with a plan to convince his mother to let him take the car that night. But then, when he went back to talk to his mother, they just started arguing again. Opal told Leslie to take a walk to cool off. Leslie went on a walk, but he didn't calm down. Instead, he came up with a disturbing plan. He got home at about 2.30 that afternoon he made his way to his parents' bedroom. He picked up his father's semi-automatic Remington rifle. He then went and confronted Opal. He told her that he was going to take the car and he was going on the date with Crystal. Despite having a rifle in his hands, Opal laughed at him. Leslie claimed he had never intended to shoot his mother, but he did just that. He shot her in the chest. He then moved closer and shot her five more times in the heart area. Leslie's 42-year-old father, William, happened to walk into the house not long after the shots were fired. Leslie said that his father took a swing at him and he ended up shooting his father six times in the abdomen. After Leslie murdered his parents, he dragged their bodies into the basement. They had bled to death on a rug, so he took the rug out to the garage. Leslie then went over and talked to his neighbor, Rose Grossman. Leslie explained that he had a senile grandfather. He said that his grandfather was traveling with his grandmother from Wyoming to California on the train and they had gone missing. His parents had left immediately to go help with the search. Leslie asked Grossman to take care of his brother James until his parents returned and she agreed. So when James got home, Leslie took him right over to Grossman's home. Leslie then went home because he had to get ready for his date. Leslie took Crystal out to the drive-in that night and then he returned to the home where he had murdered his parents hours earlier. He thought that the house was eerie and he was filled with dread. He ended up turning off the radio and sleeping with his door closed. The next morning, he went to church by himself. When he got home, he borrowed a shovel from a neighbor. That night, he dug two shallow graves under a lilac bush in his backyard. He then dragged the bodies of his parents up from the basement and then put them in the shallow graves and covered them with dirt. Eight days after the double murder on October 5, 1958, Leslie's grandparents unexpectedly showed up at his home. It was the same grandparents he had told people that they had gone missing. Leslie's grandparents were suspicious of him, but they didn't stay long. It turned out that the grandmother had phoned Rose Grossman a few days earlier to see if Opal had left any instructions regarding her grandsons. While they talked, Grossman inquired about the senile grandfather. The grandmother had no idea what Grossman was talking about. After the phone call, Grossman started investigating aspects of Leslie's story. She found out that the train that Leslie said his grandparents were on did not leave at the time he said it did. She also talked to Leslie's brother and learned that Leslie and Opal used to have violent arguments. Grossman then considered calling the police. What she didn't know was that Leslie's extended family was also thinking of calling the police but his grandmother didn't want to jump to conclusions. 
On October 10th, about two weeks after the double murder, Rose Grossman ended up calling the police and told them what she knew. Leslie's great uncle also went to the police that day. The next day, detectives picked up Leslie at school and brought him to the police station for questioning. He quickly confessed to the murders and then he led the detectives to the bodies. Leslie was subsequently charged with two counts of first degree murder. If he were to be convicted, he could have been sentenced to death. Instead, he pleaded guilty to two counts of second degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison. On June 2nd, 1959, just three months shy of his 17th birthday, Leslie Arnold was sent to the Nebraska Penitentiary in Lincoln to serve his sentence. There's a good chance that Leslie's life sentence would have been commuted and he would have eventually been paroled, but he didn't wait for that opportunity. On July 14th, 1967, eight years into his sentence, Leslie and a fellow inmate, 33-year-old James Harding, managed to escape. Harding was serving a sentence for killing a man during a robbery. Harding and Leslie weren't friends, but they both desperately wanted to get out of prison. They got a man who had recently been paroled to help them. They told him that when things were in place, to place an ad in the classified section that read, NOF arrives with a date that things were supposed to unfold. So when they saw the classified ad, NOF arrived July 14th, that was their cue that a package would be arriving at the prison on July 14th and they were to escape that night. On the morning of July 14th, the parolee threw a cardboard tube over the fence and Harding picked it up. Inside the tube were two rubber masks and a hacksaw. That night, Leslie and Harding bunched up their blankets and pillows in their bed to make it look like they were in bed. Then they put the mask on the pillow to make it look like their heads. After that, they made their way to the music room. Earlier that day, they had sawed off some bars of the window and then put them back in place. The bars were held together with chewing gum. That night, they simply removed the bars and climbed out the window. They ran 30 feet to a 12-foot tall barbed wire fence and scaled it. The man who got them the hacksaw and the mask was waiting on the other side of the fence. They got into his car and they drove off into the darkness. After they escaped, Harding called a childhood friend and he agreed to help them. He bought them bus tickets to Chicago, Illinois and gave them all the money he had. In Chicago, Harding and Leslie parted ways. Massive manhunts for both men were launched. But neither man was found in the days or weeks after the escape. In May 1968, nine months after their escape, Harding was arrested in Los Angeles because of a stroke of bad luck. Weeks earlier, on April 4, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated by James Earl Ray. Ray wasn't arrested in the weeks after the murder. Harding had the unfortunate luck of resembling Ray. A woman saw him in the bar and thought he was Ray, so she called the authorities. Harding was arrested and sent back to Nebraska. Eight years later, his sentence was commuted and he was paroled. During that time, William Leslie Arnold remained on the lam. In fact, since he split from Harding in Chicago 54 years ago, there have been no confirmed sightings of him. In September 2017, a new piece of evidence surfaced that indicates where Leslie went after Chicago. In December 1968, 17 months after Leslie escaped, an American citizen, most likely Leslie, used the name William Leslie Arnold to register with the Brazilian government as a resident alien. Leslie used his real name, birth date, and hometown on the residence card. On the back of the card, it indicates that Interpol is looking for information on the resident because he is wanted by the FBI. The card had been stored in an archive in Sao Paulo, Brazil. 
a man who was fascinated with genealogy, found the card on a genealogy website after he read an article about Leslie's escape. Investigators who have been tracking Leslie were not surprised to learn that he had traveled to Brazil. While in prison, he showed Harding a book that said if a foreign man impregnates a Brazilian woman in Brazil, there is an excellent chance that the Brazilian government would extradite him. It's unknown if the Brazilian authorities ever look for Leslie. It's also unknown how long Leslie stayed in Brazil, if he left at all. He may have died there, or he may still be living in Brazil. He may have also moved on, and he could be living anywhere in the world, if he's still alive. If William Leslie Arnold is alive today, he would be 79 years old. On the left side of the screen is what Leslie may have looked like when he was in his 50s, and on the right side is what he may have looked like in 2010 when he was 66 years old. Number 1. Ishmael Muslim Ali Ronald Ishmael Labi was born in August 1947 in St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. He grew up poor and he was frustrated by the caste system in St. Croix that was based on skin color. Labitte first got into trouble when he was in high school. He was training horses and he got into a fight with a white man over his horse. Labitte hit the man with a rock. He ended up getting expelled from school over the incident. When Labitte was 16 years old, he was arrested after he and several friends stole a car and went joyriding. Labitte was given a choice of facing trial or signing up for the army. He chose to enlist in the army. He was promptly sent to Vietnam. Labitte hated being in Vietnam. He sympathized with the Vietnamese and he was disturbed by the number of civilian deaths. Labitte got in trouble while serving in Vietnam. He beat up a white serviceman and ended up in military prison. While incarcerated, he converted to Islam and he took on the name Ishmael Muslim Ali. He was then dishonorably discharged from the army. Afterward, Ali traveled to New York City and he became involved with the Black Panthers. He stayed in New York for a while and then he traveled back to St. Croix. When Ali got back, like a law black man on the island, he couldn't find work. He eventually started a political group that supported independence from the United States. To support their cause, Ali and his followers sold marijuana and committed robberies. On September 6, 1972, it's believed that Ali and four accomplices, 23-year-old Warren Ballantyne, 21-year-old Raphael Joseph, 21-year-old Mario Smith, and 23-year-old Beaumont Guru, went to the Fountain Valley Resort in St. Croix. They were all wearing masks and they were armed with guns. The five men robbed the resort's pro shop and restaurant and demanded the wallets and purses from the guests. Tragically, the robbery turned violent. Fifteen people ended up being shot. Eight people, seven white guests and a black maintenance worker died due to their injuries. The five men then made their getaway. Less than a thousand dollars was stolen. It's believed that the golf resort was targeted as a political statement. It was a symbol of racial equality because it was a place where rich white people visited and poor black people served them. The golf resort was also notable because it was owned by the Rockefeller family. The massacre shocked the people of the Virgin Islands. It also had significant effect on tourism, so police action was demanded. On September 12th, six days after the mass shooting, Ali was arrested. Soon, his four accomplices were also arrested. Ali and his accomplices had already been on the radar of the police and the FBI because of their politically motivated crimes. Once in custody, all five men confessed to the murders. They went to trial in July 1973. 
their lawyer tried to get their confessions dismissed. The man claimed that they were tortured into confessing. Several people testified that they saw the six men being tortured. The police and the FBI denied that any torture took place. The trial was often disrupted by Ali's outbursts. The jury ultimately found all five men guilty of the eight murders. Ali and his accomplices were all sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences and an additional 90 years. Ali served 12 years in maximum security prisons throughout mainland United States. In 1982, he filed an appeal contesting the legality of sending him to federal prisons. He also claimed he felt unsafe in those prisons. He was sent back to St. Croix to await a decision on his appeal. His appeal was unsuccessful and he was ordered to go back to prison on the U.S. mainland. On New Year's Eve 1984, Ali was led onto a plane with two guards after everyone else was seated. After Ali was seated, he told the guards they had a stomach ache and he needed to use the washroom. They ended up taking him to the washroom three times. When he emerged from the washroom after his third trip, he was armed with a gun. He grabbed one of the flight attendants and made her take him to the cabin. The airplane had a system that would make a dinging noise to alert the crew and passengers. For example, a ding would indicate that the passengers could undo their seatbelts. The flight attendant did four dings in a row which indicated that there was trouble in the back of the plane. One of the pilots got on the phone with the flight attendant. She relayed a message from Ali. He said that he wanted to be taken to Cuba. The pilot told him that he didn't think that there was enough fuel to make it to Cuba. Ali explained that he was serving eight consecutive life sentences in prison so he didn't have much to lose. The plane ultimately landed safely in Cuba. Ali then made a speech to the passengers explaining that he was a political prisoner and he was seeking asylum in Cuba. He apologized for causing any problems and he wished everyone a happy new year. Many of the passengers thought that for an armed hijacker he was polite and friendly. After landing in Cuba, Ali was arrested. For stealing the plane, he was sentenced to seven years in a Cuban prison. Ali served his sentence and they worked as an English teacher and a translator. After that, he sold juice from a stand. He also got married and raised a family. In 2016, a documentary about Ishmael Muslim Ali called The Skyjacker's Tale was released. He has sat down for an interview for the documentary. In the documentary, Ali denied committing the murders. He said that he knew how to rob a place without killing people. He also explained how he got the gun on the plane. While he was incarcerated in St. Croix, several people visited him. One of them gave him a gun. He then hid the gun near his groin. Ali knew he wouldn't go through the metal detectors when he was brought to the airport because he was wearing handcuffs. Then, when he got into the washroom for the third time, he retrieved the gun. In late 2014, President Barack Obama tried to restore relations with Cuba. Then in June 2017, President Donald Trump put the brakes on any deals with Cuba until certain conditions were met. Specifically, he wanted Ali and all American fugitives living in Cuba to be extradited to the United States. In an interview with the New York Times, Ali said that Cuba wanted their sovereignty respected and they would not be bullied. So he did not think that he would be extradited. Currently, Ali appears to be correct. At the time of this recording, 74-year-old Ishmael Muhammad Ali is living as a free man in Cuba. For the eight murders, Ali spent 12 years in prison in the United States. He has spent 37 years in Cuba. 
He is still wanted by the FBI and they consider him armed and dangerous. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Don't forget to check our podcast, Into the Killing. You can find Into the Killing on CastBox, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.